and welcome to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. I'm Taylor. You're Danny. Uh, this is going to be our, our last episode for the next couple weeks. We're going to take the next two weeks off. That's my fault. I have I have some time off. I don't have people in town, but we Big have a lot. slacker. Right, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we have a lot to, to talk about in this one. So since we last recorded, um, the Penguins made a couple of uh, free uh, front office moves. They fired um, Alex Shaw. He is the director of Hockey Ops. Tina Murray, she is the senior vice president of integrated performance. That's just a fancy title for managing like the medical and the strength and conditioning staff. And then Carrie Huffman, who was the director of pro scouting. So knowing that they're also looking for a GM, maybe they also hire an assistant GM and the vacancies they just created. There, there are quite a few openings uh, in the Penguins front office. And whenever you hire a new GM or, or president of hockey ops like the Penguins did, it, it's not uncommon for them to, to bring people over from their last organization. Uh, I mean, or, or people they've worked with in the past. Hextall did it, maybe not the best example, but I mean, Rutherford did it. Rutherford brought people over from Carolina. So that's kind of to be expected. So we thought it'd be useful to look into um, Toronto's front office and see who m- kind of makes sense for Kyle Dubas to bring over for the Penguins front office and, and the vacancies they have now. And were you saying? Yeah, I, I was just gonna say like it, it certainly seems like there's a there's a handful of candidates that that Dubas was. It maybe not ends up bringing over, but it, at least because I, I tended to follow the Leafs pretty closely over the past, I don't know, four or five seasons, or which was basically his tenure there, just because I loved watching Austin Matthews play. And I, I just ended up getting all kinds of information about him. But it, it seemed like Dubas had like some really close relationships with people in that front office, whether he brought them in or um, kind of facilitated those relationships after he took over as general manager. So it definitely seems like there's going to be some movement there. Um, so yeah, let's dive into it. Yeah. The, the one I'd be looking at um, first, uh, Brandon put him right now. He's the assistant uh, GM. He's been this, with the Maple Leafs. He's been the assistant GM since 2018. Um, before that, he was the special assistant to the GM for four seasons. This is who I'm hearing is, is Dubas's favorite for the, uh, for the GM job, uh, something, you know, Dubas said in his introductory press conference was, you know, he doesn't want, um, he's going to handle the GM duties at least until July. So something that it usually means that there's an issue with like permissions, getting permission from the past team, which would kind of line up with this because you're not going to get permission to talk to Pridham right now at this time of year. Um, and something also he mentioned is, in that press conference is that, you know, in AGM, he's looking for someone that has a complementary skill set, something, you know, he doesn't excel in to add to him. So maybe, you know, an Eric Tolsky, like a, a Carolina, someone else who's a uh, strong background in advanced uh, analytics, maybe not a fit here. But Brandon Pridham, he was like the Maple Leafs cat geek, um, the CBA, all that. Before he actually worked for the Leafs, um, he worked in the league offices for, for a long time. Um, he worked in central registry. And he, so he was the contact person there for the league's GMs and other executives. So any questions they had regarding the cap, the CBA, central scouting, they'd call Pridham. Uh, and then so he was kind of the the cap guy for the Leafs. And then you look at who the, you know, the Penguins just got rid of. Alex Shaw, the director of hockey ops, he was the Penguins um, cap guy where he would figure out all the cap questions like that so this just seems like a natural fit for me like there's the Dubas connection but then also kind of fills a void in the the cap specialist type of role yeah I I definitely agree and I I like the I one of the things I think Penguins fans should be excited about with Dubas is that I I have a feeling that he's going to do a very good job of building out his front office with complimentary people like you mentioned um, so that they can have all their bases covered. Cause I, I think a great sign of a leader is someone who acknowledges that they don't know it all and that they're not going to be able to do it all himself or themselves. So having someone, especially cause it, it seems as though Dubas is not saying that he doesn't have any knowledge of, of the cap or the, or the CBA or anything like that, but it seems like a lot of his strengths lie in player evaluation, roster construction. Whereas if he can have someone that he can lean on like Pritt, them, 
um, to help him kind of navigate those nuances like I do with you all the time. <laughs> um, uh, it, it would be super beneficial. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all to, to see him end up to if he ends up coming over. Um, and it, it certainly seems like he'd be a good fit. The the name people are talk I see fans throwing out is is Jason Spezza. I don't I don't know if I would say Jason Spezza is my pick for the GM. So Spezza, um, he played his last three seasons as as a player in Toronto, and then the year this past season was his first year where he was retired. And Dubis brought him in as the special assistant to the GM, and he was kind of Dubis's right hand man. I mean, anytime they'd show Dubis in the press box, Jason Spezza is, is mm-hmm. right right next to him. Uh, I and and Jason Spezza, so the Dubis found out he wasn't going to be um, brought back uh, by the Maple Leafs was it May nineteenth. Spezza submitted his resignation that, that same day. Um, so it, it, it feels like Spezza, I would, I would imagine Spezza comes over in some compa- capacity. And then that's another, you know, a, a, skill set Dubis doesn't have because he didn't he wasn't a player he never played at least professionally so I I would I would expect to see Spezza come over but I, I don't think I'd expect him to be a GM maybe an assistant GM or a title like director of hockey ops or you can just make up titles yeah I, I I'm not expecting I I am I would be shocked honestly if Spezza doesn't end up in the Penguins front office because as you mentioned whenever you would see uh you know the the camera pans to the to the Leafs management box up there you wouldn't see Dubas and, and Shanahan next to each other it was always Dubas and Spezza and then they um they had their moments where they they seemed to get pretty fired up together especially with each other so um but yeah i i I really like the idea of of bringing him in as well he was during his playing career he was a an incredibly smart player very good two-way player i know that doesn't automatically make you a, a good hockey ops staffer but at the same time seems like he he made a good pretty good impression uh, with the work he did while he was in the Leafs front office. And um, yeah, I, 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 he's another guy, him and, and Pridham, I, I think would be strong additions. Yeah. Uh, there, there are two others uh, we're going to take a look at. We're going to take a break first and then we'll come back and look at uh, some of the other options who might come over with Kyle Dubas in the, in the front office. All right. And we are back. So, one of one of the firings uh, the Penguins made right after hiring Kyle Dubas was Tina Murray, senior VP of Integrated Performance. It's the fancy title for managing the medical uh, strength and conditioning staffs. That's not necessarily a role that needs to be filled. It wasn't a role before last season. Hextall brought her in. What was she with the Sacramento Kings? Um, yeah. It was an, yeah, it was an NBA team. Um, that was so. That was a brand new position created for her, but ideally, you would have someone, I guess, in that role overseeing the strength and conditioning staffs. And the the Leafs have under Dubis have had a pretty robust strength and conditioning um, department. So if you're looking at who might come over, um, one name that stands out to me is Richard Rotenberg, and he's he's worked with Dubis for quite some time. So the running joke narrative with with Dubis is that he has like such loyalty to people from the Sioux Greyhounds organization in the OHL um and and Rotenberg is is one of those guys so um you go back to so when Dubis was first named GM of the Greyhounds in the 2011-12 season one of his first hires was Rotenberg um he was the head therapist and strength coach and then when in 2015-16, that was Dubis's second season as AGM of uh, the Maple Leafs and general manager the Marlies, the the AHL affiliate of the Maple Leafs. Um, he brought Rotenberg in and he named him the director of athlete performance. And then when Dubis was promoted to GM of Toronto in 1819, uh, Rotenberg followed. Right now, he's the director of high performance. So he's held that title since um, 2018-19. Uh, he has a degree in um, uh, physiotherapy from Queen's University, kinesthesiology from McMaster University. This this seems like a perfect fit. Just uh, you look at the the Greyhounds connection, and that this I guess the strength and conditioning medical area um, of the Penguins front office is something that I don't know if you could say have been lacking, but they could definitely use some help. Um, with the injury situation. So this just seems like an easy, I, I would be surprised if this didn't happen. 
Yeah, part of it, I mean, you you just look at, at the, the history here. Like, I don't know what would change all of a sudden after after he's followed Dubas around basically wherever he's been at that all of a sudden something would change now after all these years. So that's part of it. Um, the uh, it's, it's really hard to, especially when you get into like strength and conditioning and like the sports science, it, it's really hard to get too in depth with some of these people. Cause it's like, you don't necessarily know what they're doing on a daily basis. Um, and, and also there's like extenuating factors too. They could be doing their job great and they might, you know, the team might still be suffering these debilitating injuries or whatever. Um, but to one of your points that you brought up last summer, I spoke with um, Jack Han, who is the author of Hockey Tactics. Uh, he does like a, a yearly annual, um, basically like a playbook for every NHL team, kind of going breaking down how they like to play in all three zones and everything like that. Well, he used to work. Um, he used to coach for the Marlies and was also in the uh, Leafs front office at one point in time. And one of the things that we talked about when I talked to him last summer was that the Leafs had done a phenomenal job of building up their sports science department and optimizing it so that they were able to get the most out of their players and limit a lot of those injuries. I think one of the specific things that he said is that they were super proud that they went like an entire season without any of their players ending up with a groin injury. I'm pretty sure, which is like a very common hockey injury, um, especially for some of those older guys. And we know the penguins, they, they got their fair share of older guys. So um, again, it, it's, it's hard to really speak too in depth on, on some of these individuals that we just really don't know a lot about what they're doing behind the scenes, but you know, I'm on board. Speaking of, Sue Greyhounds. There's one former Sue Greyhound currently on the Penguins. You know who he Jeff, is? Jeff Carter. Yeah. And actually, Jeff Carter was playing for the Greyhounds when Dubis was, was there. He, Dubis he wasn't was, just playing. He was their captain. He was the captain. Um, Dubis, because he started out um, the Greyhounds as a, as a scout when he was like 17 years old. So it was, I believe, his first... Um, three years in the in the Greyhounds organization were, were Jeff Carter's last three and so yeah Carter was captain for two of those so uh two of us and basically what we're getting at here is that Jeff Carter is going to be playing second line center next season and Evgeny Malkin will be forced to waive his no movement clause to go play for the Coyotes <laughs> just kidding that, uh, if, if, if that happens there's serious problems <laughs> <laughs> um so one more uh, member of the front office, I think, would, would make sense. So this one wouldn't be replacing someone who's been fired because the position is currently occupied. Um, so right now the Penguins' director of amateur scouting is Nick Pryor, uh, son of Chris Pryor, who was just fired, the, the former assistant GM. Uh, Nick Pryor, I mean, head of amateur scouting. No team is going to fire their head of amateur scouting um, this close to the draft. So I – it. Maybe this is something where if they are going to move on from him, it would come after the draft. It's hard to really assess his time here because he's only been director of amateur scouting for one season. Last draft was his first. Um, and now he, I think they came away from that draft with a pretty good class. It's hard to evaluate this early. And in talking to him at that last draft, he seemed like a pretty intelligent guy, very well-spoken. Um, Seemed like he knew a lot about these players, even when you're getting into like the sixth and the seventh rounds. Um, but he's kind of the definition of a nepotism hire. I mean, you go back to uh, I, like his his dad. He got hired under his dad. His work experience prior to this in front offices was eight years as an amateur scout for the Flyers, and he was hired when his dad was the director of scouting and Hexta was assistant GM. So I, 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 I don't know. I. If there are better options out, there are probably better options out there. Um, yeah, the the nepotism ran deep with the Hextall regime. Brett uh, Brett Hextall, Ron Hextall's son, is still in the yes. uh, organization. He works in yeah, I, I had I had one of our subscribers like a week or two ago um, when uh, when Shaw and, and Tina Murray got let go. One of our subscribers went on the Penguins website and was like scrolling through all the like front office people, the sports science people. And someone's like, I noticed a, a Brett Hextall on here. Is, is that someone that's related to Tehran? And I was like, yeah, that's his son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, I the Penguins made a wave of hirings under Hextall. Like they announced like four at one time, and I can't remember who they all were. They were mostly like scouts and stuff like that. But it was like every single one was either a former flyer or like the son of a former flyer who mm-hmm. played with Hextall. So it, those guys might we you know see their way out of out of the organization. But so if 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 Nick Pryor is on his way out, there is an option in the in the Maple Leafs front office that makes a lot of sense. Um, Wes Clark, he's been with the Maple Leafs since 2018. Um, he's been their assistant director of player personnel since then. And he's also in his second season as Toronto's director of amateur scouting. So he's, he's has experience, um, in that, in that role and former Sue Greyhound. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Dubas in his first season as the Greyhounds GM, he named uh, Wes Clark the director of hockey ops and then later promoted him to the director of player development. And then when Dubas uh, joined the Maple Leafs in 14-15 as the assistant GM, uh, Clark followed as an amateur scout and a player evaluation consultant. Um, he left. He was with the Panthers uh, for two seasons, seasons as an amateur scout before coming back to Toronto um, in his current role. So... I this is someone that you know just knowing the connection and that he has followed Dubis um, through every stop. Even if this wasn't like a knock on like Nick Pryor, I, I would just expect him to come in because Dubis is more familiar with with Wes Clark. Yeah, I, I don't have a, much to add on on what you said about Clark, other than like Rotenberg. I don't know what all of a sudden would have changed after following Dubis around for for so long that all of a sudden something has changed. Um, maybe there's a possibility that Dubis wants to to switch things up and, and go in a different direction. But I, I just don't see all of a sudden because he left Toronto that he would necessarily feel different about those hires or, or the, the work that those people do. So again, it's, it's all lining up here for, for this to kind of make sense. Yeah. I don't know. Jeff Carter, did he get a role in the front office when he uh, retires <laughs> because, uh, because of the Sue Greyhounds connection? Sp- special know. special advisor to the president of hockey operations. <laughs> yeah, yeah Spe- like that's- special advisor to all the centers on the team so that they can be sixth in the league in faceoff percentage. No, that's Matt Cullen's job. Matt Cullen is the. Uh, yeah, well, Cullen- guess what, Cullen, your job is in your job is in jeopardy, pal. Jeff Carter's coming. Matt Matt Cullen, he wasn't around a whole lot. I mean, he's he's still in the front office. He wasn't around as much last year in person. The year before that, he would come out a couple times a year. Um, this year, though, Matt Cullen, he became part owner of the Fargo Force in the in the USHL, and uh, Penguins prospect Zam Plant plays for Fargo, and um, he said, you know, whenever they're at home uh practicing Matt Cullen is usually on the ice with them in kind of like a skills coach kind of role and then he said uh he also goes over to Cullen's house for dinner once a week so Cullen's uh I don't know really I, embracing I'm embracing that dad role <laughs> oh yeah well and yeah Zan Plant's really leaning into the Jake Gensel comparisons because Zan Plant when he yeah. was you know brought in that was he said he looks up to Jake Gensel former Minnesota high school hockey players um similar playing styles but then also like going over to Matt Cullen's house and playing with his kids like I feel like that was what Jay Gensel was doing when when Matt Cullen first came came here so pretty cool I don't know hopefully we'll see uh Matt Cullen more next year I I it was like a trend so whenever he was he would come here last year um in person it was a lot of face-off work now and now he was even when he was to be clear, when even when he wasn't here in person, he works with the team virtually, pretty regularly. He does like video meetings, um, but in yeah, person, that's probably, that's probably a good note to add because I'm sure some people were like automatically like, why why does he have a job if he shows up twice a year? What is he even yeah. doing? Yeah, he's bailing on the Penguins for the Fargo <laughs> Force. No, he's he's still he, he it's a lot of video stuff that he can do from afar. But he, when he would come in person, it would be a lot of face-off meetings and it's totally just a coincidence but it was like every time he'd come over the next game in face-offs the penguins would be like at least like 60 percent and a couple of us would be like joking in the press box like matt collins influence (laughs) um so i don't know if there's any truth to that definitely just a coincidence but we're gonna take a break we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about john good old pittsburgh boy All 
right, we are back. The, the number one question for the Penguins this offseason is what is going to happen in goal. Uh, they're going to re-sign Tristan Jari. They're going to look... Uh, the free agent market is kind of awful. So I feel like if it's not going to be Jari, you're going to look at the trade market. Kyle Dubas did say in his introductory press conference that they're going to look at all their available options, trades, free agents, Jari. And if Jari is the top of the list, then they're going to look to re-sign him. But if not... They're going to look at some of these other options. We've talked a bunch. I feel like we talk about Yusei Saros or Jeremy Swayman every week just because they are guys who are a possibility to be traded. Uh, Connor Hellbuck, we haven't talked about him yet. He's an option now that it's looking like he's going to be traded too out of Winnipeg. But a name that Penguins fans throw out all the time, John Gibson, and I know you. I don't. I don't think we've talked about him on in past episodes before, but we're both pretty in agreement that no on Gibson. And I know you just wrote a story about it. So I'm gonna talk about why you're a big hard no on Gibson. Yeah, it, it's so funny to me. I feel like hockey, and and this might just be in, in sports in general, but I feel like hockey specifically there's like this weird phenomenon where fans and and even in some cases front offices are like so behind the eight ball that when they finally start to catch on to something, like it's already too late. So there was a point in time from, I want to say it was 2015 to 2019. John Gibson had a, he never won a Vezina trophy in any of those seasons. However, he had a legitimate claim as the NHL's top goaltender over those four seasons from 2015 to 2019, uh, according to evolving hockey saved 91 goals above expected, which means if, if he, he saved 91 more goals versus if he had just performed as a league average guy, that is insane. 91 goals. Okay. Never won the Vezina, but, Adding all that up, you look at the the goalie who was in second place over that uh, time frame was Sergei Bobrovsky. He saved 50-some goals above expected. So to blow your peers out of the water in that fashion over an extended period of time at the most volatile position in the sport is, is quite frankly, remarkable. I remember arguing at the time that he didn't get enough credit um, among national hockey coverage. I thought he was great. But those days are long gone. They're long gone, okay? Over the past four seasons, Gibson has allowed 20 and a half goals more than expected. So he went from blowing his peers out of the water to all of a sudden not even performing at a league average level. And yes, uh, let me backtrack first. Nobody would be bringing Gibson's name up if it wasn't for his geographical location of his birth, okay? John Gibson is a, a... is a Pittsburgh boy. Yeah, if, if you even want to really say he's a Pittsburgh boy, but he's from the people, area. People say Sam Lafferty is, and he's from like an hour outside of Pittsburgh. Right, right. The, the, the radius is pretty large for what Ian Zers will accept as one of their own. Yeah. That being said, if you go to his NHL.com page, it says birthplace Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If that were not the case, and it said Boston, Massachusetts, or Orlando, Florida, or wherever else, no Penguins fans would want anything to do with Gibson. And it is legitimately insane to me that he keeps getting like he's at the top of so many people's boards legitimately just because he's a Pittsburgh guy. Now, uh, the the first thing that comes out of these people's mouths when they say why they want Gibson, they're not going to say it's because he's a Pittsburgh boy. They're going to say, well, he's been playing behind an awful Ducks team. And you know what? That's true. Over the past four seasons, the Ducks have allowed allowed the highest rate of expected goals against during all situations. That is fact. But that still accounts for allowing over 20 and a half goals more than expected during that time. Okay, so even accounting for how shoddy and how porous the Ducks defensive work was, Gibson still wasn't even able to meet those very, very minuscule expectations. Okay, there is. There's no. Do, do you want to explain what I feel like a lot of people listening don't know what expected goals is and what that means? So, oh, do you want to get to get... I mean, very brief, like spark notes, explain it like I'm five because I feel like uh, yeah. that's 
Because a lot of people are going to be like, well, of course his numbers are bad. He's behind a bad team. But this accounts for that. Right. So uh, in a nutshell, expected goals attempt to weigh the probability of an unblocked shot attempt becoming a goal. So essentially, a and, and there's all kinds of different inputs that go into it. I could sit here for a half an hour talking about the nuances of it and different expected goals models and all that kind of stuff. But dumbing it down, it's it's assigning a probability to each unblocked shot attempt to figure out. And this this is based off of um previous history right so they're not just like ooh, like that looked like a really good shot we're going to give this a 33 percent probability that's not how it works it, it uses past history of goals and shots that were saved or or missed the net to to come up with these probabilities so for instance if uh, a team gives up three expected goals in a game right and gibson allows five then his goal saved above expected would be minus two, or he allowed two more goals than expected. The inverse of that, if the Ducks allowed three expected goals that game and he only allowed one, he would have a positive goal save it, saved above expected at plus two, or he would have saved two more goals than expected. So that's how all that works, and that's why I've really pushed back against the idea that, oh, yeah, he's he's, he's just been playing behind a bad Ducks team. It's like, no, this is being accounted for, and even if you want to try and say that, yeah, maybe he could bounce back a little bit um, on a better defensive team, there's nothing here that shows that he's going to be – and I argued this in my in the column that I wrote the other day that you're referring to, but the whole point of the Penguins potentially spending some futures assets like their, the 14th overall pick in this year's draft or someone like Owen Pickering or, or whatever the package may be, the whole reason that the idea of that is entertained and, and trading that for a goaltender is to get stability and high-end stability at an extremely volatile position. Well, they, going after Gibson, not only would you be depleting those assets, you probably have to spend a little bit more because of his $6.4 million cap hit for another four seasons. He's going to be 30 by the time next season starts, so you can't even say, oh, he's a young guy, That blah, 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 blah. That's not the case. OK, so there, there's a tremendous amount of risk here and I'm just not seeing anything like if you're going to go out and spend all these assets and, and utilize that cap space for someone, you want to get someone like a Soros or a Swayman or a Hellebuck who you, you can quantify their top end play over the past, whether it was a past season, the past two seasons, past three seasons. Those are all guys that have proven that Gibson has not OK, and yes, you could even argue, well, the Ducks were terrible. Gibson mentally checked out. He was worn down from just getting barraged. In either event, is that somebody that you really want to hedge your bets on? I, yeah. I certainly don't think so. Yeah, I, the, the contract is the biggest thing for me because, like you said, over $6 million for for the next four years, the max the Ducks could retain in a trade is half. Um, you'd – and they they're not going to want to you know take on that that money for the next four years. I mean they're they're not good now, but you'd think that they they maybe see themselves getting out of this rebuild in you know four years. They're not going to want to handcuff themselves that way. So you'd probably have to bring in a third team as a broker. So maybe the Ducks don't retain half, or maybe they do, and you just have to pay them a whole lot in assets and like picks and prospects to do that. But then maybe because the Penguins can't afford to really pay a whole lot more for for the goaltending position, Jari right now makes three point five million. Um, you, you'd have to get another third team in as the broker, and then you have to pay them to take on money. With the cap only going up one million dollars next year, cap space is at such a premium right now because so few teams have any. If if you're if you want another team to come in as a broker, it, it's going to be very expensive to do that. You're better off taking those same assets, like you said, putting them towards, like, a Soros, who only makes $5 million for the next two years. Totally reasonable. And, like, the argument, I, whenever we bring up, like, Soros or Swayman or whatever, like, yeah, okay, they can't offer sheets Swayman, you can trade for his rights. Um, people say, like, oh, the Penguins don't have the assets to compete with, like, a, you know, another team. If you're ta but we're mostly talking about, like, draft picks like high-end draft picks not so much prospects prospects even like like an owen pickering is so much less valuable than an actual first round pick it's like a 
It's like a car, it loses value and you drive it off the lot when you're talking about like picks like that. I so the Penguins have draft picks to give up. Like they they haven't lost many beyond this this season. It's just a matter of like how how much you want to mortgage the future. And I think if a goalie is one of the big things separating you from being a contender or not, then like I would absolutely mortgage the future and that's a problem to deal with later. Right. 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 And something else I keep going back to as well. We talk, we talk about this, I feel like every week, but if, if you're legitimately looking at the Penguins competitive window and operating on a basis that you got to go all in this season or it's probably not going to happen. Right. Sure. It might happen another two, three seasons, whatever. But if, if you're talking about a competitive window that is just completely tunnel visioned on the season that is right in front of you, I just don't see how you could, could, put all your eggs on a in a in a basket for a guy who i mean like it, it's not even just the analytics either it's it's the raw save percentage hasn't hasn't been good he was below 900 this uh this past season he was barely above it the three seasons before um there he, there were three seasons in a, three or four seasons in a row where he was like above 920 and he dipped down to like 917. And then since then, his save percentage has topped out at 904. So this isn't even like, a, oh, the analytics are saying he's bad, which the analytics, by the way, are accounting for that awful Ducks defense that everybody keeps bringing up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I don't I'm not asserting here that Gibson is going to be an awful goal. And, and the other thing, too, he, ha- he hasn't been awful. He hasn't been good, though. And the Penguins don't need to be going after a goaltender who hasn't been good over the past four seasons. Is there a possibility that he could turn a corner and become an above average goalie again? Yeah, sure there is. And as, as we've talked about a lot too, goaltending is extremely, extremely volatile. We, we see it with Sergei Bobrovsky. He he's making ten million dollars a season. He didn't even start this this uh, this postseason as the Panthers starter, and then he went on an insane run for three rounds. And then first two games of the Cup final, he gave up a total of eight goals. Right. So it, it's so so up and down. That yeah, Gibson be- could become another uh, a, a good goalie again. He could reach another level, especially on another team that's maybe playing a not putting as much of a burden on him. But considering the contract, considering the age, and considering the past four seasons of evidence that we have, there's just absolutely no reason that the Penguins should be involved in any sort of discussions about bringing him in. Have you considered that he's from Pittsburgh? <laughs> if you look at like. You make like a flow chart of, you know, so like this is how like Penguins like fans approach like a free agency and trades and stuff like that. And it's like, is he from Pittsburgh? And it's like, yes, then yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> then, then yeah, then the rest doesn't matter. Is he any good? Yes. Is he, is he not that good? Mm, still yes. <laughs> like that's because th- this happens every year. JT Miller, JT Miller was like the guy. And yeah, that Mike Sullivan did want J- JT Miller. There's legitimately something there. But the way the fans are like, JT Miller is what's separating this team from a Stanley Cup. And then uh, over the summer, Trocek, you know, back when we didn't know what was going to happen with Malkin. You know, uh, I, I will never forgive the <laughs> hooligans who clamored. I'm not just talking suggested. I'm talking clamored for replacing Evgeny Malkin with Vince Trocek. What are we doing here? And there were legitimate internal discussions in the front office, like if, you know, plan B, if Malkin doesn't work out, is Trocek an option? And ultimately they decided no, um, Malkin, Malkin's the guy, but Saad, before that it was Saad, there's mm-hmm. there's someone every year. We're, we're a couple of years from now, I'm sure it's me, Logan Cooley. Well, it's Logan Cooley's like out of his entry level deal. Uh, and he's like looking for a new contract. Penguins fans are being like, is this the guy? Should we go after Logan Cooley? Um, and I, part of this is because Pittsburgh natives in the NHL is a relatively new thing. There haven't been a ton before that. Um, you know, there's like Ryan Malone who did play here, but the number of, you know, big name guys elsewhere around the league, that's fairly new. So I, I don't know how many more, Pittsburgh natives need to make the NHL before it's just kind of like a normal thing and Penguins fans aren't like we need to go collect them all yeah I I I don't know that we'll ever reach that point part of what makes Pittsburgh such a great city is how much love 
the people here have for the place. And there, there's like a sense uh, of community within that. And, but especially as it pertains to celebrities and athletes, there's like this infatuation, this fixation. I don't know if it's like just a sense of comfortability or familiarity and like, Oh, they're, they like went through the same thing I did. They're familiar with like the Boulevard of the allies, for instance, like I, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. <laughs> Is, is Michael Hauser the uncertain goal? Answer in goal? <laughs> I think Wexford. Um, he is the. He's still in the did same. He even play he, in the, did he even he, play in the NHL last year? I don't think he did last year. The year before, he did against the Penguins. Um, I I think he's still in the Sabres system. But yeah, goalie goalie from Wexford. He's he's basically yeah. That's basically Pittsburgh. Bring him in. Gosh, anyway. you, know, you know he's gonna show out playing for his home hometown team. You know he's that's, he's gonna buck ten years of data just because he's playing in Pittsburgh. What happens that, when they go on the road? By the way, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the, what yeah that's what people keep saying with Gibbs. And I, I was reading the comments in your story. They're like, well, you have to and you know figure that he's gonna want to win real bad when he, he's in front of his hometown team. Like if you bring in someone like a Soros, he's not gonna want to win that bad because he's not in Finland. Like, what are we talking about? Everyone, everyone wants to win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> like, you, USA Saris, you, USA Saris left his home in Finland and has been living here for how long because he doesn't care that much about winning. Like, no, he wants to right. That's That's like a non-issue. Anyway, we've wasted too much time on this. Hard no on Gibson. Uh, <laughs> that's it for this week. Uh, like I said in the beginning, we're going to be taking the next two weeks off. That's my fault. I have time off. I'm uh, going to have people in town. Taylor Swift is in town. Um, that's partly why. I don't have tickets. We're going to go hang out outside of uh, Heinz Field or whatever, Ac- Acrisure. My friend that's not from here is coming. She's like, what do they call it now? Athleisure Stadium? I was like, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, Athleisure Stadium. <laughs> Heinz Field. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll be back after that. That'll be the day after the draft. Well, after we get back from the draft. So we'll have mm-hmm. Plenty to talk about for sure, maybe trades, um, but definitely some picks to talk about. So subscribe to us uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, Apple, Google, Spotify, or if you want to watch this, we're on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Penguins YouTube. It's a channel we kind of recently started. Only Penguins content, video interviews, dance, daily shots, all that kind of stuff. We do live streams there too, so if you subscribe there, you'll get notified whenever we go live. So uh, stay subscribed to us and then we hope you'll join us uh, three weeks from now. <laughs>